All right. In this video, I want to talk about cults and how Christianity is not a cult. You see, in Christianity, we're a family. We're all children of God, brothers and sisters, right? And in the family, every sibling can go to their father, right? You don't have to go through a brother or sister to go to your father, right? Uh, that's basically how it is. Unless you got some weird family that you're part of, which would make it a cult, right? And since we're all brothers and sisters, children of God, we're all equal. We can all go to our Father on our own. We can get into prayer, and we can read and study the Bible, and we can get to know God for ourselves. We can get to know our own Father. We don't have to go to one of our brothers or sisters to know our own Father, right? Granted that... Some of our brothers and sisters might be closer to God than we are, and we can learn from them, and they could correct us on our behavior and get us on track so that we can get closer to God ourselves. Or vice versa, we might be close to God and we can correct others to be like, hey, you, you know, what are you doing here? And show them how God is displeased with this or show them how God is pleased with something else to encourage him to keep doing something that is uh, pleasing to the Father, right? So we can still help each other as brothers and sisters. The thing is, is that we don't stand between anybody else and God. They don't have to go through us to go to God. We don't have to go through them to go to God, right? Because we're all equal. And that's what makes Christianity not a cult, because the Bible is the authority. No man, no organization is the authority. It's the Bible itself. And we can all go to the Bible and read and study it. I'm going to do a video later on. I've already done a few on it, talking about the King James and being King James only. So I'm just going to reference that here. So if you want to know what Bible, it's the only one that's in the public domain and not copywritten, showing that it's not the Word of God. I mean, not the Word of man, that it's actually the Word of God. Uh, but I'm going to get into a video, like I said, later on, or you can check out some other videos I've already done on it. Uh, but anyway, we can all come to God ourselves. So that's what makes Christianity distinct from other religions and it makes it separate from a cult. You see, a cult, as it's defined, has a leader that stands in the place of God as God's representative here on earth. And you have to go through him, or at times her, to go to God. All right. So it's as if one of your brothers and sisters in Christ tries to make it as though you have to go to them to talk to God. And it's like, no. Or I mean, talk to your father, right? If you have brothers and sisters, could you imagine that one of your brothers or one of your sisters says you have to go through them to talk to your parents? You'd be like, uh, no, get out of the way, right? Or, you know, today you can just grab your phone and be like, I'm talking to them, right? And you can't stop me from talking to my parents, right? Well, in Christianity, we have different cults come up because we have different people come up and they want to stand in place of God and be God's representative here on earth and act as though you have to go through them to talk to your own father. And the biggest cult would be the Catholic Church, right? Because you've got the Pope who claims his name is Pope, which means father, and he's called the Holy Father, which is the title of God the Father. So he's taken on the title of God to himself when he's not the father of anybody, right? He doesn't preach the gospel to anybody, so he's not the father of them in the gospel. And he's celibate, or supposed to be anyway, so he doesn't have any biological children. So he's not a father in any sense of the word, but he takes on God's name, the Holy Father. He's called the Vicar of Christ, which means he's the Christ on earth, or the Messiah on earth. So he's taken the place of the Son. Right. And he even claims to be God's representative here on earth. And a lot of Catholics say that he has the authority over the church. Right. And that's just as silly as saying that a brother or sister of yours has authority over all of you and you have to go through them to go to the father. Or your mother. Right. When in rea reality, you don't. Right. Um, and some people might be taking analogies. Well, there's times where 
the parents put a certain sibling in charge, right? And it's like, yeah, that is true. Sometimes, you know, you got a brother who's watching over you or a sister that's watching over you. And the parents are like, yeah, make sure they don't get into trouble and whatnot. Yet, brothers and sisters oftentimes will abuse that authority, right? It's not as if because God gave them charge over the house while they're gone, that that makes them good and godly like he is, right? No. So if that brother or sister that's in charge is going against the father, you can just ignore them. And then when the father comes home, guess who he's going to support and who he's going to reject? He's going to support you because you obeyed him and reject the brother or sister that was in charge because they weren't in obedience to him, right? Because when your father leaves the house and he tells you the rules, he doesn't just tell the rules to the sibling that's in charge. He tells it to all of you, right? So if your brother or sister that's in charge hears the rules just as you do, but they're the ones that don't want to obey them, how are you going to be the one in trouble when you reject their supposed authority over you? Where you decide to follow what your parents said instead of them. You'd be doing the actual right thing by obeying your parents and not your sibling. So if somebody wants to bring some kind of silly analogy like that, uh, that backfires pretty quick. So anyway, uh, that basically summed it up. But I wanted to actually read a couple passage here, passages here to show this. In Matthew chapter 20, starting at verse 20, it says here, then came to him, him being Jesus, the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, what, what, what wilt thou? She saith unto him, grant that these my two sons may sit the one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of? And to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said unto him, We are able. And he saith unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand, and to sit on my left, is not mine to give. But it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the other two brethren. So we see here, the other ten of the twelve disciples got upset about this because these other two brethren were going to be put above them, right? But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. The key here, he's talking about how the Gentiles are, and how they exercise authority upon them, of the great ones, right? But it shall not be so among you. The very next thing after he says they exercise authority upon him, he says it's not going to be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister or servant. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant or minister. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So we here we see about Jesus saying basically that he's the example of somebody who is highly exalted, where Jesus was a jobless, homeless man going around helping others, where he gave up heaven and even gave up a nice life here on earth for our sakes, that he may serve everybody, everybody, not just the ones that he likes, not just the ones with high status or with money, but everybody, right? And he's showing that that's the example, and this is exactly what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 5. Uh, here at verse 1 he says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, he shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Right? 
So here he's talking about feeding the flock and not to be a lord over God's heritage. Right? Being willing not for filthy lucre. And we actually see with uh, Catholic Church being the biggest one as an example where they want your tithes to support them. Right? They, they're making merchandise of you. They, they take this vow of celibacy and they take this vow of poverty, but they're, do, they're way more well off than the rest of us, especially the Pope. I mean, a vow of poverty, he's doing it wrong. He has nothing to worry about whatsoever, right? And it's disgusting at times to see uh, the pictures of the Pope walking in Africa with these skin and bones children and individuals reaching out for him and he's just walking by him as if he's blessing them and taking care of them by his mere presence is disgusting uh, but uh yeah uh continuing with that since we're on catholicism i just wanted to point out here in first peter chapter 2 how peter says that we are a holy priesthood a royal priesthood right he calls us all the believers a priesthood. So again, making the statement that we're all equal, right? And Peter being called a stone, as we read in John chapter 1, that we also are lively stones. So he's making us equal to him, right? Kind of like he says that he's equal to the elders. He doesn't say, oh, uh, I'm all, uh, they are elders, but I'm the head of the elders or I'm the head of the church. He goes, no, they're elders, but I'm also an elder among you too, right? He's he's putting himself equal to everybody. And he's saying that we're all equal as priests built up upon Jesus. So again, making this equality among us. Now, the cults are the ones that want to change that. And we can actually see that in the Bible. It actually warns us about this in Revelation chapter 2, and it might mention it again in chapter 3, but it might mention it both times here. But uh, right here at verse 6, it says that you have those that, ha uh, that hold to the deeds of the Nicolaitans here. And the Nicolaitans, what that means is to conquer the people or to conquer the laity, you know, the layman, which is all of us. And what that was is they were setting up a hierarchy, a priesthood, like the Jews had. When we're all priests, they want to make a differentiation so that they can conquer the people. And then it's uh, like a church or two later that we're talked about that these deeds have become uh, doctrines of the Nicolaitans. Just taking a quick skim here to see if I can find it. It might actually be in the next chapter. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, if you want to check it out, it's actually in chapters 2 or 3 of Stumble the Churches. Uh, right here, it actually says it, verse 15. So ask them that hold the doctrines of Nicolaitans, which he hates. And why does he hate it? Because this is the exact opposite of what Jesus was saying was going to be among us. Is that we're not going to have authority over one another, right? Because that's what ends up happening, is when a, uh, a brother or sister gets authority. We're all corrupt. We're all sinful. That's why we can't be uh, put in authority over one another because we're, we're easily corrupted and we'll start taking advantage of that, right? So they'll make up the thing about you tithing to them when in Acts, the tithes was for the whole church, for everybody in it, not just for the so-called clergy, the priesthood. Right? You read that in Acts chapter 2 and chapter 4 where the people would sell everything and they used it to support everybody. That means you and me too, right? But the churches are not like that today. Like the Catholic Church, if you've got a problem and you go to the church, you're either going to get some prayer, they're going to do some mass for you, or maybe they'll do some kind of bake sale or something along those lines, a bingo thing, and try to raise money to help you. But they're not going to give their money that you've and everybody else been tithing this whole time. No, that's not for you at all. It's for only for them because they've set up this cult. And that's why today uh, the majority of Catholics, I'm going to say 90 plus percent of them, are just Catholic because they're born into it. They're indoctrinated into it. 
Uh, very few actually convert to it, and the ones that do convert, they convert for either political reasons, marriage, or uh, financial reasons. It's not actually because they truly believe Catholicism is true. The only people who believe it are those who have been doctrinated into it. Uh, but anyway, that is that. Thanks for watching and take care.